Story eight of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day Ten Christmas Stories by Edward Everett Hale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story eight Love is the Whole A Story for Children. This is a story about some children who were living together in a western state in a little house on the prairie nearly two miles from any other. There were three boys and three girls. The oldest girl was seventeen, and her oldest brother a year younger. Their mother had died two or three years before, and now their father grew sick, more sick and more, and died also. The children were taking the best care they could of him, wondering and watching, but no care could do much, and so he told them. He told them all that he should not live long but that when he died he should not be far from them, and should be with their dear mother. Remember, he said, to love each other, be kind to each other, stick together if you can, or if you separate, love one another as if you were together. He did not say any more then. He lay still a while, with his eyes closed, but every now and then a sweet smile swept over his face, so that they knew he was awake. Then he roused up once more and said, Love is the whole, George, love is the whole. And so he died. I have no idea that the children, in the midst of their grief and loneliness, took in his meaning. But afterwards they remembered it again and again, and found out why he said it to them. Any of you would have thought it a queer little house. It was not a log cabin. They had not many logs there, but it was no larger than the log cabin which General Grant is building in the picture. There was a little entryway at one end, and two rooms opening on the right as you went. A flight of steps went up into the loft, and in the loft the boys slept in two beds. This was all. But if they had no rooms for servants, on the other hand, they had no servants for rooms. If they had no hot water pipes, on the other hand, a large kettle hung on the crane above the kitchen fire, and there was but a very short period of any day that one could not dip out hot water. They had no gas pipes laid through the house, but they went to bed the earlier, and were the more sure to enjoy the luxury of the great morning illumination by the sun. They lost but few steps in going from room to room. They were never troubled for want of fresh air. They had no doorbell, so no guest was ever left waiting in the cold, and though they had no speaking tubes in the house, still they found no difficulty in calling each other if Ethan were upstairs and Alice wanted him to come down. Their father was buried, and the children were left alone. The first night after the funeral they stole to their beds as soon as they could after the mock supper was over. The next morning George and Fanny found themselves the first to meet at the kitchen hearth. Each had tried to anticipate the other in making the morning fire. Each confessed to the other that there had been but little sleep, and that the night had seemed hopelessly long. "'But I have thought it all over,' said the brave stout boy. "'Father told us to stick together as long as we can, and I know I can manage it. The children will all do their best, when they understand it. And I know, though father would not believe it, I know that I can manage with the team. We will never get in debt. I shall never drink. Drink and debt, as he used to say, are the only two devils. Never you cry, darling Fanny. I know we can get along. George, said Fanny, I know we can get along if you say so. I know it will be very hard upon you. There are so many things the other young men do which you will not be able to do, and so many things which they have which you might have, but none of them has a sister who loves them as I love you. And as he said, love is the whole. I suppose these words over the hearth were almost the only words of sentiment which ever passed between those two about their plans but from that moment those plans went forward more perfectly than if they had been talked over at every turn and amended every day. 
That is the way with all true stories of heart and home. For instance, it was only that evening when the day's work of all the six was done, and for boys and girls it was hard work, too. Fanny and George would have been glad enough, both of them, to take each a book and have the comfort of resting and reading. But George saw that the younger girls looked downcast and heavy, and that the boys were whispering round the doorsteps as if they wanted to go down to the blacksmith's shop by way of getting away from the sadness of the house. He hated to have them begin the habit of loafing there, with all the lazy boys and men from three miles around, and so he laid down his book and said, as cheerily as if he had not laid his father's body in the grave the day before, "'What shall we do to-night that we can all do together? Let us have something that we have never had before. Let us try what Mrs. Chisholm told us about. Let us act a ballad.' Of course the children were delighted with acting. George knew that, and Fanny looked across so gratefully to him, and laid her book away also. And in a minute Ethan, the young carpenter of the family, was putting up sconces for tallow candles to light the scenes, and Fanny had Sarah and Alice out in the woodhouse with the shawls and the old ribbons and strips of bright calico which made up the dresses, and George instructed Walter as to the way in which he should arrange his armor and his horse, and so, after a period of preparation, which was much longer than the period of performance, they got ready to act in the kitchen the ballad of Lochinvar. The children had a happy evening. They were frightened when they went to bed, the little ones, because they had been so merry. They came together with George and Fanny, and read their Bible as they had been used to do with their father, and the last text they read was, Love is the fulfilling of the law. So the little ones went to bed, and left George and Fanny again together. Pretty hard, was it not? said she, smiling through her tears. But it is so much best for them that home should be the happiest place of all for them. After all, love is the whole. And that night's sacrifice, which the two older children made to the younger brothers and sisters, as it were, over their father's grave, was the beginning of many such nights, and of many other joint amusements which the children arranged together. They read Dickens aloud. They cleared out the corn-room at the end of the wood-house for a place for their dialogues and charades. The neighbors' children liked to come in, and under very strict rules of early hours and of good behavior, they came. And George and Fanny found not only that they were getting a reputation for keeping their own little flock in order, but that the nicest children all around were entrusted to their oversight, even by the most careful fathers and mothers. All this pleasure to the children came from the remembrance that love is the whole. Far from finding themselves a lonely and forsaken family, these boys and girls soon found that they were surrounded with friends. George was quite right in assuming that he could manage the team and could keep the little farm up, not to its full production under his father, but to a crop large enough to make them comfortable. Every little while there had to be a consultation. Mr. Snyder came down one day to offer them forty dollars a month and his board if he would go off on a surveying party and carry chain for the engineers. It would be a good line for promotion. Forty dollars a month to send home to Fanny was a great temptation, and George and Fanny put an extra pine knot on the fire after the children had gone to bed that they might talk it over. But George declined the proposal, with many thanks to Mr. Snyder. He said to him that if he went away the whole household would be very much weakened. The boys could not carry on the farm alone, and would have to hire out. He thought they were too young for that. After all, Mr. Snyder, love is the whole. And Mr. Snyder agreed with him. Then, as a few years passed by, after another long council, in which another pine knot was sacrificed on the hearth, and in which Walter assisted with George and Fanny, it was agreed that Walter should hire out. He had a chance, as they said, 
to go over to the Stacy Brothers in the next county. Now, the Stacy Brothers had the greatest stock farm in all that part of Illinois. They had to hire a great deal of help, and it was a great question to George and Fanny whether poor Walter might not get more harm than good there. But they told Walter perfectly frankly their doubts and their hopes, and he said boldly, Never you fear me. Do you think I am such a fool as to forget? Do I not know that love is the whole? Shall I ever forget who taught us so? And so it was determined that he should go. Yes, and he went. The Stacy's great establishment was different indeed from the little cabin he had left, but the other boys there and the men he met, Norwegians, Welshmen, Germans, Yankees, all sorts of people, all had hearts just like his heart, and a helpful boy, honest as a clock and brave as St. Paul, who really tried to serve everyone as he found opportunity, made friends on the great stock farm just as he had in the corn room at the end of the wood house. And once a month, when their wages were paid, he was able to send home the lion's share of his to Fanny, in letters which every month were written a little better, and seemed a little more easy for him to write. And when Thanksgiving came, Mr. George Stacy sent him home for a fortnight, with a special message to his sister, that he could not do without him, and he wished she would send him a dozen of such boys. He knew how to raise oxen, he said, but would Miss Fanny tell him how she brought up boys like Walter? I could have told him, said Walter, but I did not choose to. I could have told him that love was the whole. And that story of Walter is only the story of the way in which Ethan also kept up the home tie, and came back, when he got a chance, from his voyages. His voyages were not on the sea. He hired out with a canal boatman. Sometimes they went to the lake, and once they set sail there, and came as far as Cleveland. Ethan made a great deal of fun in pretending to tell great sea stories, like Swiss Family Robinson and Sinbad the Sailor. Freshwater voyaging has its funny side, as has the deep-sea sailing. But Ethan did not hold to it long. His experience with grain brought him at last to Chicago, and he engaged there in the work of an elevator. But he lived always the old home life. There were three other boys he got acquainted with, one at Mr. Eggleston's church, one at the Custom House, and one at the place where he got his dinner, and they used to come up to his little room in the seventh story of the Mackenzie house, and sit on his bed and in his chairs, just as the boys from the blacksmiths came into the corn room. These four boys made a literary club for reading Shakespeare and the British essayists. Often did they laugh afterwards at its title. They called it the Club of the Tetrarchy, because they thought it grand to have a Greek name. Whatever its name was, it kept them out of mischief. These boys grew up to be four ruling powers in Western life. And when, years after, some one asked Ethan how it was that he had so staunch a friend in Tory, Ethan told the history of the seventh-story room at the Mackenzie house, and he said, Love is the whole. Central in all his life was the little cabin of two rooms and a loft over it. There is no day of his life, from that time to this, of which Fanny cannot tell you the story from his weekly letters home. For though she does not live in the cabin now, she keeps the old letters filed and in order, and once a week steadily Ethan has written to her, and the letters are all sealed now with his own seal ring, and on the seal ring is carved the inscription, Love is the Whole. I must not try to tell you the story of Alice's fortunes, or Sarah's. Every day of their lives was a romance, as is every day of yours and mine. Every day was a love story, as may be every day of yours and mine, if we will make it so. As they all grew older, their homes were all somewhat parted. The boys became men and married, the girls became women and married. George never pulled down the old farmhouse, not even when he and Mr. Vox built the beautiful house that stands next to it today. 
He put trellises on the sides of it. He trained cotton easter and Roxbury waxwork over it. He carved a cross himself and fastened it in the gable. Above the door, as you went in, was a picture of Mary Mother and her child with this inscription, Holy cell and holy shrine for the maid and child divine. Remember thou that seest her bending or all that babe upon her knee. All heaven is ever thus extending its arms of love round thee. Such love shall bless our arched porch. Crowned with his cross, our cot becomes a church. And in that little church he gathered the boys and girls of the neighborhood every Sunday afternoon and told them stories, and they sang together. And on the weekdays he got up children's parties there, which all the children thought rather the best experiences of the week, and he and his wife and his own children grew to think the hours in the cabin the best hours of all. There were pictures on the walls, they painted the windows themselves with flower pictures, and illuminated them with colored leaves. But there were but two inscriptions, these were over the inside of the two doors, and both inscriptions were the same. Love is the whole. They told all these stories, and a hundred more, at a great Thanksgiving party after the war. Walter and his wife and his children came from Sangamon County, and the general and all his family came down from Winnetka, and Fanny and the governor and all their seven came all the way from Minnesota and Alice and her husband and all their little ones came up the river, and so across from Quincy, and Sarah and Gilbert, with the twins and the babies, came in their own carriage all the way from Horace. So there was a Thanksgiving dinner set for all the six, and the six husbands and wives, and the twenty-seven children. In twenty years, since their father died, those brothers and sisters had lived for each other. They had had separate houses, but they had spent the money in them for each other. No one of them had said that anything he had was his own. They had confided wholly each in each. They had passed through much sorrow, and in that sorrow had strengthened each other. They had passed through much joy, and the joy had been multiplied tenfold because it was joy that was shared. At the Thanksgiving they acted the Ballad of Lochinvar again, or rather some of the children did, and that set Fanny the oldest and Sarah the youngest to telling to the oldest nephews and nieces some of the stories of the cabin days. But Fanny said, when the children asked for more, there is no need of any more. Love is the whole. End of Story 8